Hi, YouTube. Today is June 26, 2020. And today we're going to look at the weekly question thread on reddit.com r slash factorio. If you uh, like this sort of thing, make sure you hit that like, subscribe, ring that bell so you get notified uh, of a next time I drop a video. If you have a question, leave it in the in the uh, comment section below, or you can come to twitch.tv slash contound, and we do this every Friday night where we unpack a little bit of the questions in the weekly question thread and answer your new player questions, or sometimes even experienced players have questions that me or the chat, uh, for me or the chat, and we can uh, unpack them, look at a demo, etc. cetera. So uh, thank you very much for watching this video, and, uh, and let's get to it. All right, the weekly question thread. Here we go. TZU22 says, first off, I know a bit about the game already. I launched my first rocket, and now I'm on my second save with the plan to go for a bit larger base. My question is, is it feasible to expand to new ore patches, completely blueprint and bot base without laying tracks while inching forward in the in the train or laying tracks while running? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not there yet resource-wise, but think it should be possible to leapfrog outwards without with overlapping blueprints of roboports and radars, as media has experience with that. Um, yeah, you can, uh, I think if you're just trying to lay some track with, that has a, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're trying to lay track all the way up to a, to a, um, a robo or a, to a patch of ore, all you really have to do is put in your tracks in with all your signaling and then make sure at one end of the blueprint is the uh is a robo port and then the other end of the blueprint is the robo port and make sure they have the yellow dots and uh, dots connecting them and also make sure that there's they're both powered uh, i don't know if it's possible to do this inside the uh, like in between the two tracks so a lot of times you have some space in between two tracks where you put your power lane power lanes in between those so maybe you could put robo ports in there and then if you just paste all those along, you can probably paste those in map view, and the robo port, the robots, as long as they're connected to your main network, the robots will place the first one, the second one, third one, and they'll just place an order, and that lets you stay in main base and just go in map view. So I'm going to assume that you don't have biters to deal with because if you place too far out and you trigger some biters, uh, they'll come get you. Um, but if you don't have any biters, this should be fine, or if you don't have any cliffs either. You may have to deal with some uh, some cliffs as well, but theoretically, you should be able to as long as your blueprint um, is is as large as your RoboPort network, and you paste over the previous and you paste uh, in over the previous one, and do it by sections where they overlap. You should be able to do that. <clears throat> so interesting question. Yeah, that is that is uh, that is definitely doable. All right, the switchblade again. I'm trying to figure out uranium nuclear power for the first time, completely from scratch, without looking at other people's blueprints. I have no patience for that. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just wondering: is it normal that I need to make extensive use of the circuit logic system to get things working? Yes, it is. Specifically, Covrex and Covrex enrichment. Right. So that is that is an example of a process that does need to be primed. It is. It seems part of the only part of the game I can't make work reliably without a ton of additional logic. If that's the case then that's totally fine. I'm just wondering if perhaps some uh, simply making a big mistake somewhere. No. The troubles that you're having uh, on uh, on the Covrex process are common. And what you need to do is you need to uh, somehow get 40 of the U-235s to start the enrichment process. So... Um, Actually, I'm going to make a quick little demo and we'll sh uh, of how of a great way to get this started. I can show you how to do this without having any of the um, uh, without having any of the uh, combinators used for it. You can you can definitely get this going um, uh, early on just by using some chests and then feed feed that into the excess into. The rest of the process so let's check that out right now okay so here is a Covarex process this is just one example uh what we're going to do is this this um set of centrifuges is gonna is gonna actually start the refinement uh mass refinement of this u238 
with you uh, into U two thirty five. So what you're going to have coming off of the uh, off of the line when you do um, when you do this mining process, you're going to get this uranium ore. It's going to be converted into two thirty five and two thirty eight in that percentage. Look, so you're going to have ninety nine point three percent more uh, of of your of two thirty eight. And then 0.7% 235. So 235 is going to be uncommon. Okay. So um, you're going to ha- you're uh, coming off of that off of the ore line. You're going to have so much of this dark green, and you need a process to change into the light green. Well, that's where Coverex enrichment comes in. And to get started <coughs> on all of this, you need 40 of the light green. So once you have 40, 40 of the light green, you can start this. Um, so that's that's this process. Uh, this is Coverex enrichment, is what this technology is called. You have to research this, and it needs 40 of the 235 and five of the 238, and then it'll change it and it'll consume three of those uh, of the 238 and produce one extra of 235. So it's going to go, it's going to consume three and produce one. It's going to take a full minute to do it. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in. A, I'm going to put a full stack of the green just to show abundant green, and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of uh, one at a time. I'm going to load this in here so that once and I'll show you once I hit 40 of these, it's going to start. It's going to take a little bit, so I'm going to throw in some modules. By the way, I'm using Creative Mod, which is super handy. Are those super modules, yeah, super super clean modules. Wrong. Super effectivity, super speed. There we go. That's the right one. So that this goes a lot faster. And when I produce it, um, I'm going to take that away for now. What's going to happen is it's going to output 41 and go back into here and start again. We're going to have one extra, right? So this is going to run, and every time it cycles, I'm going to have one more. Right? One more. One more every single time. So it's going to take me several minutes to get another 40 in here. And once I have 40, then I can start sending it down here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wire this up with a little uh, circuit wire. This, there's no combinators needed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, this, this ins- inserter is only going to run when this is, say, over 100. All right? So that I'm always going to have this guy running. All right? He's going to run uh, quite a bit. And once it hits, this box hits over 100, there's going to be a stored in here. Then I'll start outputting to this uh, to this side. And actually, let me, let me go ahead and grab some of this uh, extra dark green, which goes in here in my process. <clears throat> So at some point in this Coverex process, you're going to have a lot of this dark green because that's mostly what's going to be coming off the ore line. So I'm simulating this, and I've got this little process that puts it on the uh, puts it on the inside of the belt all the time. So watch, you'll see it come around, and it'll go through this filter, and uh, it just a little bit of storage, and it always puts it on the inside of this belt, right? And what we're going to have is we're going to have this uh, the light green, the 235, on the outside of this belt. Neat little process. No uh, no frills or uh, nothing fancy. And I'm going to throw some of these super speed modules so we can really get going. <clears throat> you won't be able to do this in your game. Uh, but look at that. We're up to 11. And... Uh, at some point, it will start outputting big, big patches of it out to this Coverex process. So the only thing I've really wired up is a condition here. It's not really a combinator. I just wired that uh, that um, stack inserter to a steel the steel chest, and this will sit here and run and run and run. And eventually, it'll stop because it, it may you may even run out of this dark green, uh, the 230, um, 230, uh, 238. <clears throat> Um, you just hand feed that to get started, and at some point, you know, I may simulate this here. So it's got 17. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put a stack of 60 in there, and at some point, this will reach the tipping point. Load all that in there. So it's got 20s, 20s, etc. 
And we'll just fast forward the game just a little bit, and I'll show you what ends up happening. There you go. And then once this condition is met, there you go. It, we're off to the races, and it'll output some, and it was grabbed by this first little first stacker inserter. Right? And then this guy will start running. And I'm going to go ahead and put some these speed modules in here. So you can see this one start running. Then, then what will end up happening is this is all completely full of the 238. And now once it gets its next batch of 235, it'll go. And then it'll start outputting all, uh, outputting all of its stuff in. And it'll go to the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one. There it is. Now it starts to go. And now watch. It's going to output 41. It's going to go to the next one. And it'll grab it. Most of them. And it'll start. And eventually, this will load up to where all of these are running. And this is kind of how you do it. You start with one that, that cycles in on itself. And then the overflow of that one spits onto your, your main belt that starts going. All right? So this one's going all the way around to this guy. And then he'll start. All right? And eventually, enough of this will, will empty out onto the belt and onto, the, onto this cycle to where all of these will be running all the time. And then you can start extracting and pull of those pull those 235s off through the similar process. Uh, see I've got it going on in a belt like this. And then uh, you can have it you can have it uh, pull off here as a condition to where all right, when I get when I have a thousand of these that stock up in here then we'll start outputting out to this process and then that goes to your reactor. Right? So this is a nice little process. There's combinator free. All it is is there's there's one condition, and that's this by it's this uh, inserter. It's wired up, so you need to just uh, your reg the, these parts and then one wire from the inserter to the chest, and say whenever this hits over a hundred, a hundred's a nice number. Now it'll take you a lot longer to kickstart this, probably about an hour or so to get out of the um if you have one patch of ore and you've got maybe forty of those running take you about an hour to get enough to get 40 of these 235s to get started but once you do uh, you can pot you can start these up and then uh, uh, after uh, after once you get these started up then you can feed it onto a bigger belt where the whole process will, will just get started you see I've kind of got one I've got two going now right so and there's the next one is going it's passing them along every everyone runs and then it passes that one along. And eventually, once uh, this one will start uh, feeding these, the overflow will happen, and then you'll just have this cycle where it ramps up and up and up and up and up. Um, uh, you got to be careful, though. If you neglect this for too much time, you may actually run out of this. Um, so make sure that there is a mechanism to feed at least some of this 238 back into here. You'll probably have a ton of it coming off of ore. Likely, getting it over to here is an issue. You may have to do a bunch of chests or if you have a mod you do some warehouses or something to store it all you're going to have a ton of it over here on on your ore patch but then getting it into the cycle in the right amount may be a uh, maybe a challenge but this is uh this is basically it so if you want to check this out uh what i'll do is i'll i'll take a blueprint of this um this is creative mod so uh i'll, I'll take a blueprint of this and we'll leave it in the description below um and if you really want to use this one you can if not uh yeah, this this is based the basic concept. This is a com combinator free Covarex process that kickstarts it. It's it's the the prime uh, priming mechanism, and then the Covarex process itself with uh, just ten here. Yeah, you can get it, you can make it a lot bigger for sure. You can get another side on this. You make sure the belts are are arranged right, but uh, otherwise the the concept is the same. So uh, there you go. That's a, a combinatorless Covarex process. Enjoy. IP Forever says, should I divert some of my production into a chest for personal use, i.e. conveyor belts? If not, how do I reduce the amount of crafting that I need to do myself? Okay. Should I be automating production of everything? Great question. Is it feasible to use one ore production line of iron gear wheel to build everything that it uses, or should I have multiple production lines? Okay. Um... Uh, should I divert some of my production to a chest for personal use? Yes. Um, later on, you'll call bots to deliver that uh, in your logistic window. 
um, you can call them and uh, and logistic bots will uh, will deliver to you just like the same way they will deliver to a chest. Um, reduce the handcrafting uh, that you need to do yourself. Question number two. Yeah, pretty much everything. There is <clears throat> there's a, a couple of things, a couple of different categories of things that you need to make in Factorio. There's one line which is science related. Okay. So things like uh, engines and green circuits and red circuits and blue circuits and all of those sorts of things and uh, rocket control units, all of those are all associated with science and feed into science. Those absolutely you should, you should, um, uh, those are high transaction. You're going to make, I mean, you're going to make a bunch of them. Uh, steel, a uh, great example. You're going to make, you're going to make, um, in order to get to a rocket, the minimum amount of steel you need is something like 15,000 steel, something crazy. Um, those you should, all, all of that you should automate for sure. Then there's this other section of things that are, that are the tools you need to do all of those things. So a, an electric miner is, is an, a great example of that, or assembly machines are a great example of that. So miners and assembly machines do not go into science. They're not consumed by by science anymore uh, but you still need them to achieve your goals in a timely in, in a timely manner and actually you need them you need them to get your to achieve your goals period because you uh, um, you can't really uh, for example you cannot make an engine by hand uh, you have to or an electric engine by hand you have to use an, an assembly machine to make it <clears throat> so many users uh, many players what they'll do is they will make their main lines of science, which is the high volume stuff, and then they'll make what's called a mall. It's like a little shopping mall where you make one stack of just about everything you'll need, like miners and like assembly machines, um, and uh, furnaces and uh, inserters, all flavors of inserters, uh, and so that when uh, belts, so that uh, you know, uh, so that when you're when you're going to place, you, when you're operating on the high transaction side, you can go over here and uh, go pick up a bunch of things for, for the, to use to get the high transaction side done. So there's ways to build the mall. There's lots of ways. Uh, there's a bunch of YouTube videos that show you how to make a, make a mall. I, I think I, I've even got one um, that says how to make a very, a very small um, 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 easy to build uh, mall that will get you started and get you kind of one of everything early game and will speed you up uh, quite a bit. And uh, so, yeah, um, should I, uh, to your second question, should I be automating production of everything? Just about everything. Um, there's not really much that you're going to, uh, you're going to handcraft um, except for, uh, so, for example, off the top of my head, there are some things that you probably can get away with handcrafting because their transaction value is so low. So, one example, night vision goggles. You're going to need one of those ever. So, it's probably not worth setting up an assembly machine there unless you're on a multiplayer server where all of the players are going to want them. Right? Uh, your power armor. Uh, you're gonna want to. That's you're gonna need one of those because um, in previous versions they would have durability, and the more you got hit, they the more they would uh, they would lose durability, and then they would eventually break, and you'd lose them all. Now they're one and forever. Yeah, they never break. Um, so that's a pretty much a one transaction. Uh, you don't really want to. Um, you don't want to make more than one of those um, unless again unless you're multiplayer. So there are some things that you will leave as, as handcraft, but many of the things that are the, uh, the, the, there's the high transaction, then there's the low transaction, then I guess there's a third category called the one-off. And everything in the high and the low technology, you're going to want to handcraft, or you're going to want to automate. Everything else you can handcraft. Like all your guns, you can handcraft. Because you need one of those. You don't need a bunch of them. Um things like that, but everything else that is more than one thing that you're going to need, either put it in the big transaction, in the in the high transaction volume, like on the bus or in the robo network, or make a mall in a, as a robo network, um, and, uh, and do it that way. So, 
Anyway, great questions. Uh, but uh, uh, and, and to that end, for the mall as well as the handcrafting ones, <clears throat> you probably will want to have a buffer chest. So one way to do it is to put a little splitter off of a off of a belt, and have it prioritized to go through the high transaction, and then have some excess go over here to a chest and maybe you have one or two spaces left in the chest and an inserter just fills that up and you can run by and grab it i do that in my pre-bot game i have a couple of different uh buffer chests that i set aside uh the four things that i set aside buffers uh, uh five i guess uh iron copper steel uh gears and green circuits so i have a i have buffer chests for five of those and as I run through, this is also a speedrun technique, I run through and I can pick up a bunch of those, and that really speeds up my handcrafting queue um, until I can get my mall down or until I can do all of those sorts of things. So think about think about how, uh, of what things you need to build and put them into one of those three categories. Uh, great question. Switchblade says, I want to design a base that processes X science per minute, let's say 1,000. Uh... <clears throat> Which is what's the best way to find out the exact ratios of every component for the entire base? Kirk, McDonald's, or Dumiers? There's two links I'm gonna put in the chat for you. Um, I you have to do some configuring, but that's what we use to do all of our all of our planning for speed runs and those sorts of things, and um, you know just base design and or most of most of what I do. I don't I don't usually design an entire build for it. I'll design our, our entire base for it. I'll do a specific build. Like I, I want to produce um, 100 blue circuits per minute. Now, what does that need? And then you can go to Kirk McDonald's and you can kind of put in blue circuit. You put in um, your blue circuits. You put in how many you want, and then you have to go to the settings setup page and you can input the furnace you're using, the belt you're using, the modules you're using. Um, and your defaults, how much you're going to have, and everything, and then you then it'll do all those calculations for you. It's really cool. So Kirk McDonald's is good, and Dumiers is good for for entirely different reasons. Um, they kind of do the same thing and come at it in a different different way, right? So um, oh, there's also a max rate calculator mod. How about that? You can go check that out. Maybe we'll put that um, put that in the uh, in the description for you. I haven't I haven't tried that one out, but chat just uh, inform me. So uh, yeah, lots of good create, uh, lots of good calculators out there that you can use, and uh, lots of good resources for you. So uh, good luck, Switchblade. Uber Frenzy says, "I'm new to the game. 24 total hours played. Hey, good. I'm having a lot of trouble with nests. I have armor piercing rounds. Good. Delivered all around the perimeter of my base. I've and six sets of turrets. Uh, all locations I get attacked at." Uh, the problem is that the number of buyers I've encountered has increased massively. That's right. And I recently got attacked by a ball of spitters. There must be uh, there must be more, have been more than 60 of them, and destroyed my turrets within seconds and killed me instantly and I had a load earlier save. I've been trying to clear nests, but it seems to not be helping because they're coming from further and further away. I've just got my hands on petroleum, setting up a, a, line, a, a train line to bring uh, it to my main base so I can make plastics. For efficiency modules, is there anything I can do other than put efficiency modules in my mines? Oh yeah, I can't handle it all, and I've unlocked, uh, I haven't unlocked laser turrets yet. That help? They'd probably be gunned down by spitters if they do more damage. Great question. Uh, there's another question that we're going to ask, and uh, let's get to that one right now. How leisurely can my pace be? Is there, uh, says John Kennedy Tool, there is there a point at which buyers get tired of you trying to figure out how trains work and come in the game for you? Yes. <laughs> Do type slash evolution in your console command. Hit the tilde key and type slash evolution. And uh, it'll show you not only uh, how close you are to uh, biters maxing out their power, their evolution, but also it'll show you what components uh, make up that evolution. So three things that make up evolution. One is pollution. Um, as uh, your base pollutes, uh, it'll leak over there in uh, the pollution cloud. You can hit that on the mini. You can hit the map and look at it on the mini map. There's a little toggle on and off for the red red cloud. Uh, and pollution absorbs into the biter bases, and then they use that for evolution. And they get mad, and they come in the game for you. Right. Uh, number two uh, that that uh, bumps up evolution is 
um, uh, killing their nests. So if you go out and you clear nests, which is an imperative, you have to do that at some point. Their evolution does go up. That's a pretty big factor. So if you clear a nest, make sure you take over the spot with whatever you need and put defenses up because otherwise you'll have to re-clear it. And re-clearing of uh, nests uh, is kind of useless evolution. So make sure when you jump into, you, you move into an area that when you clear nests, you do it for a purpose. Uh, and finally, uh, to your question, time is the third factor. If you do nothing, if they absorb zero pollution and you never kill a nest, time will tick by and they will just slowly tick, 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 tick. They will slowly amp up and uh, they'll they'll evolve and they'll come get you. Um, but in order to to for them to come get you, they do have to be triggered by pollution, but they will evolve and they also, uh, if you're on default settings, they will expand. Um, so there is a there is a parameter in map generation called expansion where biters will move into unoccupied areas and eventually cover the whole map. Um, there's a toggle bar that show, uh, that you can slide that up and down and toggle how fast that happens. Uh, however, you uh, um, uh, default settings is usually what every, everyone else plays that that expansion still happens without pollution. Um, but a, presumably what will happen is they're really far out and you're, uh, you have your little small base. Your pollution goes out X amount, but then they will expand into that pollution. And then they'll come get you. So at some point, your the time will add to their evolution, but also the time will add to their expansion. And then probably they'll expand into your pollution cloud and to your, to your question... They're going to come get you, so you kind of got to get after it. Um, you need to tech up. You need to make sure you invest in military. You make sure you're, you're investing not only in military tech, but also military uh, production. You need to get into that piercing ammo. You need to get uh, laser technology. Make sure you power up. Make sure you have enough power to uh, to run those lasers. Get some solar. Get some accumulators. Lots of steam. Get into nuclear and, uh, and power up so you can uh, laser them. Lasers are end game. Also, one way to do it is if you can get into oil, you can get those um, uh, those uh, flame turrets. Flame turrets run those right on, right on crude oil. Those are absolutely deadly. Put those behind a wall. Uh, those are absolutely deadly to biters. They, it's a great defense. They're kind of broken. Uh, pretty OP. So make sure that you take advantage of those where possible. And they're, they're pretty low tech. Um, I think it's like one or two military... Um, uh, unlocks in and you'll unlock this tech you need some engines and some other things to get to to make them um, so there's a little bit of a steel uh, an engine cost uh, need some steel to uh, to make them but you can uh, you can get those going real early and you'll put them in the right place and you'll be fine for a long time all right good question Call me Oscar says, does anyone know if there are any plans for Factorio to be a part of this? <laughs> I found the summer sale. <laughs> oh, man, that's really good. Oh, oh man. Oh, that's a good one. Zipperfly says, I've never played Factorio. How close to being a finished product is it? Uh, I've waited this long to play, but I don't mind waiting a bit more for a fully released version. Get it now. It's done. The game is done. And it's super stable. It's been stable for four, year, four or five years now. It's one of the most stable releases. Don't be hesitant. Uh, throw your $30 down now. In fact, the price may go up. Uh, I'm halfway expecting that coming soon because of all the work they put into it. You, you will not find it on sale ever. Uh, get it now. D. Lint says, Is there no way to get smooth multiplayer combat, even with a dedicated server, with low CPU, RAM usage, and 30 ticks of latency, which is apparently considered pretty low according to, uh, to some threads? Uh, combat and car driving are nearly unplayable. I uh, tried switching to stable version, uh, laptop, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, shotguns, for example, completely unusable. Uh, okay. 
couple things. Player to player combat. I hate to say this, but don't don't look to Factorio for player to player combat. The sh the long story short is we've tried. <laughs> <laughs> we tried. Um, I don't. I don't want to tell you other than we we tried that and it didn't really work out. Uh, lots of issues with it. What did work out was biter challenges. Uh, you can go to, back to my other videos and look at the biter battles from this season, and those are what multiplayer ends up shaking out to be, where it's PVEVP instead and you actually send biters to the other team because biter player co combat is really nice and honed in player to player nah uh, so if you want to do multiplayer uh, grab one of those and uh, and give it a shot uh, grab one of those comfy servers see if you can set that up that you're gonna have a much better time doing that than you will trying to do player versus player um, so and i'm not going to necessarily get into the cpu and ram usage and all of that i'm just saying that you're uh, as you're going down this this path, you're fighting a really uphill battle. Stein Bengal says this may be a dumb question, but is there an advantage to doing trains in the two three two layout style aside from being bidirectional? I have been using one engine and three cars and haven't had an issue, but have always I always hear about people using two three two. That's very similar to another question uh, that will uh, that will pair it with right here. Atomic. Harp Seal says, seems to me that a lot of rail systems designed with two four trains in mind, which is a train configuration I used to build my only 1K SM base. Is there a particular reason why? Yes. As far as I can tell, it seems to be hit a decent bounce of being able to quickly reach top speed. Yes. While carrying a good chunk of cargo. Exactly. That is it. There is a ratio of how fast, of how big a train is uh, when, uh, when the wagons are full. Um, there is a weight to them. Then, in order to pull that weight, um, you can. Uh, uh, in order to pull that weight, you need X amount of locomotives. And actually, one of um, one of the uh, most common ones, uh, common setups, are here. Actually, I have a picture of it. Uh, these are double-sided trains, but here are the ratios. You can see a one-two. One two one. If you have double-sided trains, that's one locomotive can can pull um, two wagons and get up to max speed pretty qu relatively quickly, um, and then and still make a get a uh, get a train to where where it's going to be, um, etc. What you can do also is technically you could do this, and you could make one locomotive pull a lot of these wagons and fill them up. This guy will do will go so slow. Uh, you're you're probably gonna have a bad probably gonna have a bad time doing this one. I can't recommend doing this. I, I can recommend uh, if you want to have decent uh, decent performance in your in your rails, uh, go ahead and go ahead and make it into these ratios. You won't go long. What you're seeing in your as as of your question is this two four two or the two four. And you nailed it with your question, which is, um, is two four is because I can get four wagons up to top speed in a reasonable amount of time, or really quickly. And by the way, a locomotive is cheap, and running a locomotive is pretty cheap. It's just that it's just rocket fuel or solid fuel, whichever one you're using. Um, so go ahead and tack on an extra locomotive. But uh, also the locomotives, you're right. Uh, chat says they don't need to be in front. You can have them, uh, yeah, wherever. It's just the most common one, where uh, common way to do it. My favorite is this one right here. I like big trains. Um, I like moving massive amounts of material, and this is a three eight three. But these are the most common ones that that players use. You kind of use whatever you want. You can use this one eight if you really want to, but your train will be dog slow when it's full. Uh, my recommended my recommendation to you is to try a three eight three, and uh, and get her done. Uh, great question. That is, uh, that is, that's a, that is a great question. I appreciate you, appreciate you asking it. Good Wolfie says, how can you get blueprints early? I saw people on YouTube having it from the beginning, but I can't get it since it's locked behind construction robotics tech. Aha. 
We found someone who has never gotten bots, bots before. Uh, this uh, good wolfie, this is a one-time unlock. Uh, so this, as soon as you research robot tech, done deal. Uh, you re re research it one time in one game, and then you'll have blueprints from the, for the rest of your playing days. Um, I think it's a, it might be achievement based. So uh, I think once you unlock that achievement, I think you're I think you're done. I don't don't quote me on that, but it's so it is a one time unlock. From then on, in all of your subsequent games, you'll you'll have it all. So uh, good job. Uh, just get on to that uh, get on to that robot tech, and then you're you're done. Purple Print says, when copying pasting structures, sometimes a pole or belt is in the way. Is there a shortcut uh, to automatically mark the existing structure as to be replaced or that are posted there? Um, you can mark it for deconstruction and placed over it. You can do, um, uh, you can do um, shift and paste. And then what is already there, you'll override whatever is there. Um and then uh, lots of different ones. What, what I would recommend is have a filtered deconstruct that removes whatever it is you want and then have a blueprint to paste over it. Because once once a uh, an entity has an X through it, meaning it's, it's marked for deconstruction, then you can paste a blueprint over it and the blueprint will uh, treat it as an empty field and, uh, and, and replace it with uh, an entity that is in the blueprint. Um, we had this question last time or someone who is wanting to redo their train signals uh, at each intersection. And the, the advice was filter out your, uh, your deconstruct planner with rail signals, wipe it out, and paste over it. Wipe it out, paste over it at all their intersections. Uh, but that's the question. That's the, uh, that's the way to do it. Good question. Uh, John Kennedy Tool says, how do you copy, paste, build commands, commands to assembler buildings? So it's a skip having to double click on each one. I see this a lot in Let's Plays and can't figure out for the lights me. Control right click, control left click. Uh, uh, or shift right click, shift left click. It's shift or control or shift? I can't remember which one. Uh, the key binds are here. Yeah, shift, shift right and shift left. Let's look at these key binds. Uh, all of these, this is, a, this is a handy one to have. It's copy entity settings. It's right here. Uh, yeah, shift right mouse button is copy. Shift left button, uh, left mouse button is paste. You can also grab a blueprint and paste over it. I do that all the time. Or you can grab a not a not this with your mouse and not a blueprint, but the copy utility at the bottom of the screen. You can copy some and paste over it, like you have in kind of a temporary blueprint. Uh, you can do that that as well. I, I'll do that quite often where if I have um, two entities side by side and one it, like red green science are always always go together in a certain ratio um, and I will have red green science opposite each other and paste and then run it all the way down but I don't do a blueprint and I don't do this I'll grab a copy paste from the control C control utility in the quick bar uh, but I'll, anyway this in, this uh, URL will be in the description below uh, if you want to uh, check out this. But this is these are great. This is a great one to bookmark for uh, uh, for your first couple of playthroughs until you learn kind of the muscle memory of how to play and how to uh, how to do um, fast base design. Quizzer one zero six. What are the alternatives to a main bus as a central design? Could be a big logistic network. Repl could a big logistic network replace it? Uh, yes, it could. Uh, this is a, a city block is one way to do this. We did a city block in a previous uh, FFF. I'll link that in the chat. Um, let's see. And let's link city block video. Yep. Let me let me make a note of that now. Uh, yeah. But a city block video is the way to do this. Um, uh, is an alternate way of a, of a main bus. Um, and uh, the, the way to do that is you can either do rails, which is a very common way, or uh, what uh, my buddy Steely Gold did in Bob's and Angels is made city blocks, but instead of trains, he had bot networks that were all separate. So a RoboPort network that, were ex that was exactly one square away, so the networks did not connect, 
And then he had chest, requester chest, and um, pa passive provider chest on each one to control the flow of goods to and from. And he would pass, uh, and so robots were really only uh, in charge of handing off a uh, handing off material from A A to B, and then they would go across the network and then go to the other side of the network and hand it off to a new network. It was a nice little, uh, it was a neat little way to do it. In fact, I'll, I'll uh, let's put up a little diagram right now, and we'll we'll show you. Here how we to have do that. a uh, a little uh, robo port uh, block base. So I've got to put one of these in my hand to see that I've divided everything up into RoboPort quadrants, and uh, uh, everything else is uh, everything else is provided in here. Actually, I need uh, I need some copper cables, so I'll make some of those. I'll just we'll just uh, put some of those in a little chest in a chest here. Uh, we'll assume though for argument those will get over here. So let's go ahead and do this and create them on. There we go. All right, so now I have bots in each of these networks that are going to drag the material to uh, to each one. So in the bottom one, bottom one, I have um, I have iron that produces steel, gears, and uh, pipes. Uh, but then over here, I need engines. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and transfer it from network number one to network number two, and let's limit these. Etc. So on the first one, we'll do steel and requ request that one. Next one, we'll do um, pipes and request those. And in the, in the last one, we'll do gears. And you see the bots will immediately start to work. And now they're passing it from network number one to network number two as they're being made, right? So then in network number two, we're making engines. All right, so I have everything being called from uh, for the for everything that's needed to make for an engine. Right, there you go, and engines are being produced. So we'll let those go for a minute. Up here, I've got uh, I've got some uh, got some iron that I need uh, to cross this barrier. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and put that in here. Just have a bunch of iron, and then in this one, same thing. I'll transfer the iron across. And just limit just a little bit. And there's some plate. So we've already got copper cables in here. And then it's, as soon as these robots get some supply, they'll be producing these gears. So now I've got the iron stuff in here. I've got the uh, engines being produced in here. I've got some boards being produced in quadrant number three. Now quadrant number four, our ultimate goal electric engines right so they've they've already got their demand set up so now i need to transfer uh boards from here let's go ahead and put this on the, on the map here and we'll go ahead and do the same thing and there we go now they'll start pulling boards across, and you see the bots immediately recognize a demand and a supply, and they'll start loading it in. Let's go ahead and add uh, the lubricants, and we'll go ahead and uh, put in a little fluid source here. There you go. Lube's in there. And now, finally, we'll transfer some engines across, across this border. Same thing here. Just limit it just a bit. Engines. There you go. Uh, right. So the one of the limits to doing something like this is you got to be careful that you don't have some the same thing going in as you as you do going out. So what I would what I might do is uh, what I might have over here is uh, this one might act as a pass through. So I have green boards over here. But uh, on this side, in this network, maybe I've got uh, some red boards I need to produce, right? And those contain green. So they, those gears, etc. So what I need to do now is I need to make some pass-throughs, right? So now I'm, I'm going to have copper cables pass through. I'm going to have these green boards pass through. Uh, 
All right. Copper cables. So now these bots in here in this network, their only their only job is to just pass things all the way through to the uh, to the next network, right? So let's make some uh, some bots here. And put them in, and then they'll find them, and they'll start going, right? And let's assume plastic comes in from somewhere else, from maybe the top. Maybe it's a pass-through as well. We'll throw that in there, and now I've got red board. So sometimes it's a pass-through, and these bots are going to be pretty busy passing all this network through. And then at some point, you may need a buffer chest to uh, to account for that, right? But here, this is a uh, this is an alternative. It's a little more complex, uh, but it is an, an alternative to a bus base where you can have these little quadrants that uh, uh, that pass material through to the next one in order to build it. And so what you might want to do is make is kind of unpack this maybe a, in a different document and patch these all together so that robotic movement is is uh, kind of optimized so you don't have something going all the way to one map and then looping all the way through and going to another one. So you may you may think through think this through. But this is a this is a way to as as an alternative to a main bus uh, strategy. Uh, Mag N Z says, "I know that ore patch richness increases with distance from spawn, but does the ore patch area also increase with distance from spawn?" No. Um, you can check this out on the wiki page. Does it does not? Um, it it does richness. It it might uh, uh, look like it's it's bigger, um, but uh, really you, the vari variability is not really uh, is not really uh, not doesn't really scale. Not near as much as the richness the richness does. Chunks and all all of those sorts of things. I'm gonna link this this wiki page. Uh, in here, the size setting adjusts the size of resource patching. Setting the slide of 200 means the surface area patch is doubled. Richness defines the yield of ore tile in, in every oil field. If richness sets 200, uh, outside of this, resource patch richness increases by distance, but does not specify size. Um, size is uh, it, it it can vary. It, they look a little bit bigger. They might be at the max of their possible size. But you're not going to find one that's half a map big. The if you go out, a, you know, several hundred miles, um, uh, one direction. But I can confirm, uh, as you if you were make a mega base uh, near your spawn and then just travel in one direction, the resource patches si patch sizes get pretty insane pretty quick if you just stick to one direction, or two go east west, um, and do some sort of ribbon world. You can get up into the billions instead of hundred millions. You can get up into the billions by default, especially if your richness is set to two hundred percent by default. It's it gets pretty crazy. You can get a lot of material the farther you go out. There you go. There's all the weekly question threads from Reddit from Friday, June twenty sixth, two thousand twenty. Thank you very much for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you like this sort of thing, make sure you hit that like, subscribe. Any comments, leave them in the in the comment section below. Uh, if you want to be a part of this uh, and a part of New Player Night, you come to come to see us live Friday nights, Twitch.tv slash Clowntown. Uh, lots of uh, lots of good interaction with chat. Um, chat is very helpful to new players. So if you have any questions, make sure you hit us up. Where we'd love to have you. Thank you very much, and we'll see you. Next time.